When Calvin does return to Geneva in 1541, it's very striking that when he returns, the very first Sunday, he stands up and he continues to preach where he left off three years before. He doesn't say a word. He doesn't say, well, here we are again. <laughs> uh, he just says, let us turn to... and. I've tried very hard, even to the point of contacting world-renowned Calvin scholars uh, through a friend to find out what that text was. Um, but, but no one's got clarity. One or two are pretty sure it was the Psalms. Someone thinks Romans. But anyway, the point is that he simply takes up the text, makes no reference to his banishment, He's a preacher of the word. So Calvin returns, and he returns with two conditions. That the church be organized or reorganized according to the word of God, and that he be allowed to produce a children's catechism. So Calvin seeks to reorganize the church according to the principles he finds in Holy Scripture. And as Calvin reads the New Testament, he finds four permanent orders of ministry. He prepares um, a draft document called the Ecclesiastical Ordinances. And you should know about that. The Ecclesiastical Ordinances. Philip Edgecombe Hughes, Philip E. Hughes, has a lengthy but good, very fine um, uh, overview of the ordinances that you can find on the internet. In this fourfold ministry, the whole life of the church was covered. Its worship, its education, its soundness and purity, its works of love and mercy. To the pastors was committed the ministry of the word and sacraments. They conducted the services, preached, administered the sacraments, uh, cared generally for the spiritual welfare of the parishioners. In each of the three parish churches in Geneva, there were another four um, in the outlying areas. In, in each of the three parish churches, two services were held on Sundays uh, and a catechism class for the children during the week, a service was held every other day, and later on, every day. The Lord's Supper was celebrated quarterly, though Calvin passionately wanted it every week. But the city council overruled him. So that's the pastors. The doctors or teachers, second group, had the responsibility for education, both for adults and for children. Uh, lectures on the Old and New Testaments were usually held on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, these were more academic than the sermons, were mostly conducted in Latin. The audience consisted of older schoolboys, ministers, and anyone else who wished to attend. The education of children was also to be provided. But here there were great difficulties owing to a scarcity of suitable teachers and lack of money. But that problem was really overcome generally in 1559 with the establishing of the Genevan Academy. Education of children was one of the paramount concerns of the Reformation. A third order in the church was that of elders. In every district of the city, there were one or two elders who would keep an eye on spiritual affairs. Uh, you know, if, if they saw so-and-so was the worst for drink or that someone was abusing their wife or whatever, um, they were to admonish, first of all, in a brotherly manner. If that response did not do the work, they were to report the matter to the consistory. So first of all, the elders were to be um, pastorally involved and seek to deal with it 
in, 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 in a quiet way. But if the admonition was not heeded, then it would go to the consistory. And they would summon the offender, remonstrate with him or her. If that failed, as a last resort, there would be excommunication, which would remain in force until the person repented. Finally, the social welfare work was the charge of the deacons. Uh, They were the hospital management board, if you like, the social security executives, the alms house supervisors. It was a proud boast. There were no beggars in Geneva. Now, I suppose it's impossible to know absolutely, but that that was the considered view. There were no beggars in Geneva. Calvin not only organized the form of the church, he played a full part in the day-to-day work. He preached twice every Sunday and every day of alternate weeks. In the weeks he was not preaching, he lectured three times a week. He was the Old Testament professor, took his place regularly on on the the consistory, uh, which met every Thursday. And he was either on committees or being asked about uh, advice, matters relating to deacons. So Calvin actually is preaching or teaching seven or eight times a week. Now, that, that, that just seems both incredible and maybe bizarre to us. And maybe the question for some people is, well, goodness, why, why so much preaching? Now, I think different answers can be given, but the one I think that Calvin would give would be simply this. The people of God need to be armoured against the vain delusions of a passing world. To, To think that one hour on the Lord's Day, once a week, is enough to armor your mind and heart against the insidiousness of the world, the flesh, and the devil uh, is just crazy. And I've little doubt that um, part of the reason why evangelical Christianity is so effete in the main, so lacking in substance and power, is because, uh, well, I think, A, we have no meaningful doctrine of the Lord's Day. And we don't really see how vital um, receiving the ministry of the Word of God is in armoring our minds. You know, we live in an atmosphere of fallenness. Now, for some people, Calvin comes over because they're ignorant as a kind of dictator in Geneva. Well, Calvin was appointed by the city council. He was paid by them. He could have been at any time dismissed by them, as he had been in 1538. He was a foreigner in Geneva. He wasn't even a naturalized citizen until near the end of his life. From 1541 to 1555, a majority, an anti-Calvin majority was on the city council. Uh, It's only 1555 to 1564, the year he dies, that there is a pro-Calvin majority in the city council. So Calvin is battling uh, not as some kind of imperious dictator. It's his moral authority stemming from his conviction that he, he is a teacher, a preacher of the word of God, God's ambassador. That was the hallmark of his life. He was not a dictator. You know, people point to, oh, well, you know, there was this law in Geneva and that law in Geneva. Geneva was a a mid-16th century city. And almost every city, in fact, every city in Europe um, had what we call blue laws, uh, laws about taverns and prostitution and... Um, 
excessive behaviour on feast days and gambling. All cities had that. It, it, it was just part of the, the age in which they lived. Geneva was no different. Calvin was what he always saw himself to be, uh, the servant of Geneva. Now, I'm going to return to the case of Servetus uh, for this afternoon, so I'm going to jump that, 1553, and we'll come back to that. Throughout his whole time in Geneva, and especially towards the end of his life in Geneva, um, Calvin was burdened with continual poor health. His overwork in his early student days impaired his digestion. Uh, he had constant migraines. His lungs were affected. Um, he was hemorrhaging. He was really tortured by bladder stones and the gout. Um, there were times he couldn't even walk a, a hundred yards to church. He was carried in a chair to preach. And when the doctor forbade him to go out in the winter uh, to the lecture room, uh, he crowded the audience into his bedroom and gave the remaining lectures on Malachi there. And friends would urge him uh, to rest. And on one occasion he replied, What? Would you have the Lord find me idle when he comes? Calvin's bodily afflictions were intensified by the opposition he faced. Uh, physical intimidation. Men would set their dogs on Calvin in the street. They would wake him up at midnight firing guns outside his house. They would at times shout out or try to drown him out when he was preaching. Uh, loud coughing. There were anonymous threats against his life. You see, this idealised picture, you know, people sitting rapt attention, you know, listening on every word of Calvin and Knox and Bullinger, you know, no, 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 no. Um, this is, there, there's tumults all around. You know, there's the atmosphere of revolution, rebellion, reformation. Um, people would shout out at him, Ile Gallus! He was not even a citizen of, of uh, Geneva. That Frenchman. Um, they called their dogs Calvin. <laughs> as well as um, trying to set their dogs on him. But Calvin stuck to his guns. He had a volcanic temper that distressed him. Anyway, the chapters now are 80, and they've been recast into four books corresponding to the four parts of the Apostles' Creed. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Church. Um, Calvin never forgot that the initial aim was to help those who were hungering and thirsting after Christ. And in fact, the 1559 edition begins with the same sentence as it did in 1539, which is nearly the same as 1536. Our true and genuine wisdom can be summed up as the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. So what were Calvin's achievements? Now, we're going to look at a number of things. This is just the overview. Well, number one, his greatest legacy to the church was undoubtedly the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Um, in, in producing the Institutes in 1536, uh, he, he makes it clear that his aim is to reply to these evil charges which others were sowing, and to clear my brothers whose death was precious before the Lord. He wants to clearly portray what the evangelical faith is. Now, by evangelical faith, 
Calvin meant a faith that was rooted, grounded, styled and shaped wholly by the word of God. By the evangelical faith, he doesn't simply mean justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Because for Calvin, the evangelical faith is about true piety. Pietas is one of the key words in Calvin's vocabulary, piety. The gospel has come to change us, to transform us. Calvin uses a word, replication. What the Holy Spirit first produced in Christ, he comes to replicate in the people of Christ. That's the evangelical faith. Benjamin Warfield writes of the Institutes, the immense service which the Institutes rendered to the evangelicals was to give a body to their ideas an expression to their faith. Before all, it is a work of organization and concentration, a code of doctrine for the minister, an arsenal of arguments for simple believers. It is, says Warfield, the summa of reformed Christianity. What he means by summa, he's referring back to Thomas Aquinas's uh, summa theologia, uh, theologica. Um, the institutes gave a body to the evangelical, to give a body to their ideas and expression to their faith. Albrecht Ritschel, a liberal Protestant, 19th century, called the institutes the masterpiece of Protestant theology. So there is the Institutes, his great legacy. Secondly, his exposition of Scripture, which covered almost the whole of the Bible. Um, I suppose like maybe maybe you, I've I've got all of uh, Calvin's commentaries. Um, I think I've just about got the whole uh, opera Calvini. Calvin stressed the natural sense of the text. He, he spurns all the medieval techniques which had reduced scripture to a kind of mystical puzzle. Um, he's been called the creator of genuine exegesis. Richard Hooker, uh, Anglican, said, the sense of scripture which Calvin alloweth is of more weight than 10,000 Augustines, Jeromes, Chrysostoms, and Cyprians. Now, that's quite an accolade. Calvin was preeminently um, a biblical theologian. Uh, let, Let me quote Warfield again. Calvin's instrument of research was not logical amplification, but exegetical investigation. In one word, he was distinctly a biblical theologian, or let us say it frankly, by way of eminence, the biblical theologian of his age. Whether the Bible took him, thither he went. Where scriptural declarations failed him, There he stopped short. So the Institutes, his commentaries, thirdly, his letter writing, I've mentioned that, 4,000 extant letters. It would be very worth your while to buy or to possess the seven volumes, the banner produced tracts and letters of Calvin. Um, Some of the letters are almost theological treatises in their own right. He writes to archbishops, kings, queens, um, dukes, people on death row, widows, children, Uh, something very, very moving. Writes to five men, maybe touch on this later, who are about to be executed. So what do you say to five men who are on death row? He says, remember God is your father. Trust yourself to the paternal goodness of God. So, letter writer. Um, Fourthly, Calvin was in a true sense the creator under God of the Reformed Church. Uh, 
John Knox, when he was in Geneva, said that uh, the church in Geneva was the most perfect school of Christ on earth since the time of the apostles. Well, that's, you know, embellished eulogy, but that's what he said. So, finally, Calvin, above all, bequeathed to the church a theology that was centered upon God. It's actually a travesty to think of Calvinism in terms of the five points. Um, 1992, I was in the States for some months with my family and I had to sit the PCA licensure exams, which were not, they're like ours, they're not difficult. But I had a viva and I was asked, are you a five point Calvinist? And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a consensual, Christian more than a confrontational one, but I thought, see, I've got I said, I find the question demeaning both to Calvin and to me. I said, oh dear. I said, you know, these five points, which I believe are very biblical, so they're taking five bones out of a body and saying, aren't these bones wonderful? Well, yeah, but unless you see them connected to the other parts of the body, they're just sterile and arid. They're, they're embedded in a glorious Trinitarian, full-orbed revelation of the Lord and his purposes. And um, So, you know, what is Calvinism? It's, it's glorying in the triune God. Um, uh, someone says, is it not more than that? Well, what, what can be more than that? And you can, you can go on and develop that. But Calvin gives us this glorious God-centered um, theology. So what do we say of John Calvin? Well, he was deus sebegit, a man God mastered, um, a model of unflinching faithfulness, dogged stickability. He took to heart the Lord's words, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Uh, he was far from perfect. Uh, at times he was unwise, he had a volcanic temper, he liked to get things his own way. He uh, came to a very fine agreement with Heinrich Bullinger on the sacraments and the consensus Tigerinus in 1549. Uh, but then Calvin went back home and redrafted some articles that more reflected his view than Bullinger's. Uh, but he was a man God mastered. And that's why uh, he should be remembered with great thankfulness in the church. So that's, that's an overview of Calvin, his life. Much more can be said. But what I'd like to do after lunch is to look at Calvin the pastor. You're trained to be pastors. What kind of pastor was Calvin? Um, we'll look at Calvin and Servetus. And then as time allows, uh, his tracts and letters, his Catholicity. Calvin was passionately Catholic in his um, understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, he was a Protestant ecumenist. He said in a letter to Archbishop Cranmer, I would gladly cross ten seas to help heal the bleeding body of Christ. And crossing ten seas in his day was a little different from crossing ten seas in our day.